Hey guys and girls, welcome back to another beautiful video on this beautiful channel on this beautiful day. How you guys and girls doing? I hope you're doing great as always. Drop a like, subscribe if you like the content. Today's video is going to be about the player of prefab. We're going to talk about what a prefab is and why we're going to use that. I'm going to create a new scene as well, since you're going to be doing some of that if you're working with games. We're going to start with a basic health script for the player, since we're going to be introducing some damage from spikes and enemies later on. We're going to fix the tearing in the tile map because that can occur sometimes when you're moving fast. And we're gonna design a new map and fix all the foreground elements and everything from the last video. So hopefully you'll enjoy this video. Let's get started. So let's start off by talking about a prefab. Now the word itself kind of hints to what it is. It's a prefabricated thing or prefabrication, whatever you wanna call it. It basically means that you can save an object in a way that you can reuse it. So you don't have to redo all the stuff that we've done to create the player, for example, every time. We just drag and drop several players into the scene. And it's really good to do with a lot of different things, enemies, weapons, all kinds of things. So we're gonna be using prefabs a lot. First thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a new folder and I'm gonna name it prefabs. Within here, I'm gonna create another folder called player. Once I've done that, I'm just gonna grab my player and drag it into that folder. And if I open the player folder, you'll see that there is a blue icon here and player and a little image for that player. And also the hierarchy object here became blue, indicating that it's a prefab. Now the thing with prefabs is that you can edit the prefab itself in a separate window. And then all the local copies of that object, which you've placed in your scene will get the changes. But you can also create different versions of the prefab locally in your scene because sometimes you might want to have enemies with a little or subtle differences from each other, but still the or basically the same thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a few more players here and you'll see that it says player one, two, three, but they're still blue and I can move these separately here like that. And if I run the game, they will all work as if they were the player. All the scripts are triggering and everything else is triggering. It looks really weird. This isn't how it's supposed to be, obviously, but it's cool to see that we can do that. So we can copy the object easily into the scene, but I could open the inspector window and make a few subtle changes. So I'll say that this object here gets a jump force of 25 and a max jump count of three, while this poor player here gets a jump force of four and a max jump count of one. And when running this, you'll see that they behave very differently. One jumps really high and one jumps really low. And this is because we can change a few things here as we like, but I could double click my player object and open this in a separate window. And then you'll see that the hierarchy tab only shows me the player prefab. And here I can change this to 25 for the prefab itself and save this. And if I go back to my scene, if I click on the objects that I didn't change locally, they'll all get the jump force of 25. But if I click on the ones I changed or did change locally, I'll see that they are different. Now the one up here, I did change to 25 manually, and that's why it's bold. And this one isn't bold, the one that I didn't change. And that is because a bold value just indicates that you've changed something for this prefab locally and it's not saved for the prefab itself. But what I could do is I could go to that one, which I have changed and hit the overrides tab here and it will show me all the things that are different from the prefab itself. So there's some changes on the movement controller and this is a diff between the original, the prefab source and the override, the current one I've selected. And you'll see I changed the 25 and three. So what I could do, I could revert it and it would change it back to how it was from the original one, or I can apply this to the prefab and then it will change the prefab's value internally. So I'm just going to revert that and then we'll see that we hit a, or we got the values back. So 25 and two. Now I could say, oh, well, I want the player to jump six times, save that, but I didn't change the value in the prefab. I changed it in a local copy. Now I want to overwrite that. So I'll go to this one. And if you just want to apply this change, you can click here and apply it. Or I could say apply all and it will apply everything listed here. And since we only have one here, I'm just going to hit apply all. What happens now? Well, if we go down, we'll see our jump count is not bold anymore. It means that it's saved, overridden, and it's available for all objects. And if I even double click my prefab here, or I just have to click it once, it will show me that it says six in here in the prefab itself. And all the other objects have that value, except for the one that I changed locally. And it still has some local changes. I could go ahead and revert all of these, and then we'll have a jump count of six. 
and a jump force of 25. Hopefully that made sense and that's how prefabs work. You can go back and forth between them and it's really logical once you get a hang of it. Now I'm going to change this back to 15 and 2 and they'll be bold but I want these changes overridden in my prefab itself so I'm just going to apply those and my prefab will get these values. It really makes it easy for us to create copies of the same object so we don't have to re-add all of these things and change all the values manually for each object. Now I'm going to save my scene because the next thing I want to do is I want to go to assets and I want to go to my scenes and I want to create a new scene by hitting scene here. I'm going to call it test because we're not going to use this scene. But if I open up this scene, it's going to be empty, right? I can hit assets and I can go to prefabs player and I'll drag my player into this scene and you'll see how easy it is to create new scenes and add these same objects back to new scenes. That's also a power of the prefab. Now we're going to start adding a health script. Now it's always good to have a test scene where you can test things around, but I'm not going to use this scene right now. Let's go head back into our sample scene and we'll add a script for the player. So head into scripts, create a new folder in here called player. And in this folder, we're going to create a new C sharp script and I'll call this health system. Hopefully you can see that now this health script or health system is going to be really simple right now. We're going to be adding more things to it as we go along, but let's start adding the variable we'll add a header as as usual and I'll just say attribute because this will contain our health and the max health we'll add a serialized field for max health so private int max health and we'll set that to three as a default and then we'll create a private variable which is not serialized so we can't see it in the inspector and we'll set that to zero and we'll add a space temp and comment it out once that's good let's go ahead and reset our health in the start function now you're going to be wondering why am I using this well this means that we're accessing the current objects so the health system that we're currently inside we're accessing its variable that's why we use this you don't have to use this that's why it's grayed out because there's no use for it in this context because we already know that max health and health are part of the health system and there is nothing else with that name here in this function so this is a c sharp thing sometimes in functions you can have a variable with the same name which is local and then it's a good idea to use this to say that hey i want this object's version of this variable to get the value of the local version so it could say var health here now it doesn't allow me to do that but it could say that here so it has the same name as the one that the object has what do we do well then we need to use this because now this 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 <laughs> is not grayed out anymore because it notices that hey there's a local variable with same name and I have a object member or a class member which has the same name so how do I differentiate between the two well I use this so this health this one will get the value of the local health like that and that makes sense sometimes you want to use the same name because it's really annoying to come up with new names that's why I'm going to be using this a lot even when it's not necessary because you get into the habit of understanding well this variable is a part of this class that's why I'm using it and a lot of people have mixed opinions on this personally I like the extra effort because when you're in the position when you haven't used this and you're getting weird errors things are happening you don't understand what's happening you're gonna kick yourself in the butt so I always use this even if it's not necessary that was a hella long explanation on that but let's keep going the next function I'm going to add is a lose health function and it's going to be public because we're going to allow this function to be called from outside this class I want enemies and environmental hazards to be able to trigger this lose health function on this player that's why it's public and it's going to be void if I could spell I have a new keyboard I'm sorry lose health so we're going to set it up to always be one for now but later on when you have enemies you might want this to trigger and the player be losing more than one health but the way we're going to build our system is going to be around the one health right now and when the time comes we're going to upgrade this to be able to handle more than one damage and it has a little bit to do with the GUI and how that's going to work but we'll upgrade that later on as well the idea here is to show you both ways the classic with the hearts where you lose one heart per damage and then a health bar system so we'll get to that but for now let's keep it like this very basic so this health equals minus equals amount very simple so we'll lose our health depending on what the amount is here which has a default value of one so if you don't assign anything to this later on it's just gonna deal one damage so you can call this function without giving any number in here if I were to remove this this function would force us to type one in here every time we call the function but like I said since I want it to be built around the one damage I'm gonna set a default value here for one it's always gonna be one until I tell it something else now we need to check 
if this health goes below zero or becomes zero, which means that the player is technically dead, we're going to reset the health to zero. So make sure it's not on any minus value. Then we're going to run something we're going to build soon, which is called death animation, which is going to be very basic to start off with. It's just going to disable the player. I'm going to go ahead and create that function and I'm going to make it private for now, even though we might need to make it public later. Death animation. This is also a preference thing. When I work officially, I use this way of typing because it saves space in huge files. But for tutorials, I do this because it's a little easier to read sometimes. So game object dot set active false. And what this does, if we read here, if you can see this, basically it deactivates or activates depending on what value you give it here, deactivates or activates the game object itself. So whatever the script is attached to that game object will be deactivated. And that means that unity won't act on it. The sprite render won't render it. No collisions will happen no scripts will run and a huge thing that some people do is that they set something to deactivate it and then they expect some scripts to run after that to respawn the player things like that that doesn't work because the game object is deactivated nothing will run on it that's why respawning and stuff should be handled outside and we'll see that when that comes up but for now let's keep it like this then i want to add two more functions another public public void gain health so just as important as losing health gaining health is important as well and amount it's going to take a while for me to get used to this keyboard. The same thing here, but reverse. I'm going to say this health plus equals amount. And then I'm going to check if this dot health is greater than this dot max health. And if you're just re writing one line if statements, you don't have to add the squiggly braces. You can just write whatever you want to do. But as soon as you go over one line, you're going to have to do the squiggly braces. So I'm going to keep it one liner here. I'm going to say this health equals this max health because I don't want my health to ever go over the maximum limit of health of, that I can have. The final function for now is going to be a public check. So it's a bool. It's going to check if the player is dead. Now I made a little mistake as well. I want these to be capital because in C sharp, usually the standard is to keep function names to start with capital letters. If you're used to C++, usually it is not a capital letter as the first letter, but in C sharp it is. So it's good to get used to that. That's actually called the principle of least astonishment. So you should check that out as well. It's a little more advanced topic, but here you go is dead. And it's going to be a very simple function. Basically what we're going to do is we're going to write return health less or equal to zero return true else return false. So this is a little one liner here. Basically what it's saying is that return true or false well if this condition is true return true otherwise return false it's a very easy but ugly way to write it but it's a good way to learn about these these one-liners which can be really useful sometimes so we're going to keep it like that now i'm going to head on to my player and i'm going to add this script to the player click on the player go all the way down and drag the health system to the add component button and you'll see that it becomes bold. All the values here are bold. And I want to add this to my prefab. So I'm going to go ahead to overrides and I'm going to say apply all. And it will apply the health system prefab to my player. Now let me go ahead into debug mode so that I can see the health. So before I start, it's at zero. And if I run this, you'll see that that will turn to three. Perfect. So that is the player prefab with the health system. Don't forget to switch this back to normal because we're going to be using that. Now to the tile map and the foreground issue. Just to recap, let's see what the issue is. If I run it, you'll see that the foreground elements, the bushes that should be in front of the player are behind the player. And if you remember in the last video, we actually had collision with these. So that has to be solved in order for us to have nice foreground elements and background elements because we do have a background itself, but sometimes you want tiles that you can't interact with that are kind of cool background elements that add to the whole depth feel. And we're gonna be doing this by adding more tile maps to our map here. So as you can see that we have tiles, but we'll add a foreground and a background tiles to help us. So to accomplish this, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go into my sorting layers right here, and then I'll say edit layers. And I'll go to my sorting layers, and I'm gonna add something called tile map background and tile map foreground. And I have to switch these layers up. And I want the tile map background to be behind my tiles and behind the player, but in front of the middle ground and the background. And I want the tile map foreground to be ahead of my player, but behind the maps foreground. So this, this foreground might be clouds. It might be something else, something that is even further ahead than these bushes and everything that has to do with the tile map. So once you've done this, the basicness, the basic part should be done. Go ahead and save your scene and jump back into your map. But right now, nothing will happen because we can't really change 
individual tiles and their sorting layers. The sorting layer is still, at, is still set to tiles and the sorting order can't really be changed here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click map to the objects tile map and I'm going to add another rectangular tile map and I'm going to call this tiles foreground. I'm going to place it right ahead of tiles. Doesn't really matter, but this is another tile map. And this one is not going to have any colliders or anything. It's not, it's just going to be straight tiles. And first things first, I'm going to go to tiles and I'm going to remove my foreground elements by hitting the razor here and removing the bushes. I'm going to click my tiles foreground. I'm going to go ahead and add a few bushes here and you'll see they're behind everything. That's because we haven't changed the sorting layer yet. Let's go to the inspector, set the sorting layer to tile map foreground. Now I want to show you if we go to the tile, if you remember, we removed the collider type, but you can set this back to sprite or grid and it would still not collide because we haven't added colliders to our tiles foreground tile map. And then you wouldn't really have to remove this, but I'll still remove it because no foreground element will ever collide with our player. So I'm going to keep it to none. Let's head on back here and let's run this. And you'll see now that the bushes are ahead of our player and that they don't collide with them. Now I added a little roof above our player and I want to show you a use for our tiles background tile map and why we might need that. So I'm going to add one more tile map rectangular and I'm going to call this tiles background. I'm going to place it above my tiles. Hit inspector and set the sorting layer to tile map background. And the same thing here, I'm not going to add any colliders here. Just keep it like this because nothing will ever collide with our background. And now this will be placed behind our player. So I'm just going to draw something here, something like that. And if I run this, all of this will be ahead of our player, but we won't collide with it. We'll collide with all of the other objects which are in our tiles tile map. This does look a little weird because it doesn't look like this is in the background, but we can fix that easily. If you look at the tile map, you'll have a little color selector here. So if you hit your tiles background and you go to the color and you just darken it a little bit like that, it looks a lot better and really looks like background elements. But you'll see we're still getting tearing here and that is the next topic we're going to talk about. So to fix the tearing, it's a little bit of a interesting fix. It's not always self-explanatory in Unity, but what we can do is we can create a something called a sprite atlas, which will make all the sprites sit together properly and help Unity render the tiles using the sprite atlas. So I'm going to right click create 2D sprite atlas and call it tiles atlas. Once that's done, I'll double click it and it will show up here in my inspector, just like a sprite. I'll remove the filter mode. I'll set it to point. I'll set compression to none and that should be done. There's no pixels per unit here, so you don't have to worry. So what you can do is you can go to your Sunnyland artwork and head to your tile set and check the name for it. It says tile set dash sliced. So I'm going to go to my tile atlas, hit plus, and I'm going to say tile set and you'll find tiles that slice here. So I'll add that here. I'll hit save, save. And you see that the tile atlas has been saved and it's packed our tile set. And I'm going to run this and you shouldn't see any more tearing. No matter what I do, I'm not seeing any tearing. So it packs your sprites for you, makes it nice. It's kind of a weird way to fix this issue, but it does fix it and you never have to deal with tearing ever again. This is really good for any type of 2D tile based game. Hopefully you enjoyed that video guys. We've done a bunch of stuff. We've added the background and foreground elements to our tile map. We've created a player prefab. We've added a simple health system, which we haven't used yet, but it's there. Fleshed out our map a little bit and we fixed some tearing here in our tile map, which can be really annoying and just ruin the immersion. So thank you for watching. Hopefully you like the video and the content. Drop a like, subscribe. It really helps me out and hopefully I'll see you in the next video. Bye bye.